You know, there's two things within us that usually happens. God's people, uh, there's a lot of people go around picking a fight. God's people aren't supposed to go pick a fight. But neither are we to run from a fight. But when you get in the fight, you don't fight like the world. You fight with the armor of the Lord. You fight it on your knees in prayer. And you fight it continually and constantly to win the day for truth and to win the adversary to Christ. That's the way you fight it, in and for Christ, in the lives of others. Hello, Bezel Triple Three. That was Pastor Harry Reeder of Briarwood Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, Alabama. He's going to be preaching on Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20, dealing with the spiritual warfare of the Christian church and the armor of God. Now, this is a very timely sermon for me, and I'll tell you why. We just finished a six-week White Horse Inn discussion group series at the church I attend called, Do We All Worship the Same God? And we looked at the challenges that the Christian faces from secular humanism, relativism, pluralism, as well as the competing and contradictory truth claims of other world religions. The series ended up by discussing the uniqueness of the Bible's revelation of God as a monotheistic God and at the same time a threeness of persons within that one monotheistic God. In other words, we talked about the identity of God as Trinity. By the end of the series, even the non-Christians who attended agreed that we don't indeed all worship the same God. Now what Harry is going to preach on is essential to understand so that we as Christians will know exactly what we are up against in this present age. Now I suggest you read Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 20 slowly and carefully before you listen to what Harry has to say. So now that you've read it and are ready to listen, here is Harry Reader preaching on Ephesians 6. Today's church in today's world. And I want to take a few moments from this passage of Scripture to walk you through that. Now, it's an interesting passage of Scripture, isn't it? It's a passage of Scripture that on the one hand says the Christian life is a matter of warfare that we just read. But secondly, it tells you you got to get in the battle. The third thing it tells you is you can't fight the battle without the Lord. The fourth thing it tells you is you need the armor of the Lord. The fifth thing it tells you is you need the strength of the Lord that's given by the Holy Spirit. But Waiting upon the Lord is not passivity. Notice all the active statements. Put on, put on, put on. Give yourself to. So it's not passivity, but it's activity. And it's very clear that we are in a spiritual warfare. How many times does he have to tell us in the text, you're waging war against cosmic powers. You're waging war against spiritual forces in heavenly places. And that this is a spiritual warfare. It's very clear about that as well. You know, that's so true. We can so easily forget that we are in a battle, a spiritual battle against the forces that are behind visible forces. False religions, atheism, relativism, and the like are all being fueled by the spiritual forces of darkness that are permitted to exist during the remainder of this present evil age. And that's what Jesus is telling us through the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Spirit of God, Five different times in the New Testament, I've just picked one, do not be ignorant of the schemes of Satan. Know his strategies. Basically, from the Word and from church history, you see two strategies of Satan. Let me give them to you. Strategy number one is intimidation. Strategy number two is infiltration. Now, you got to realize, our Savior has won the victory. He has defeated at the cross our sin. He has paid for the sins of all of his people. You have to know he has defeated Satan and sin, and he has defeated the grave. But you also need to know that in his sovereign plan, while he has defeated Satan, he has not yet destroyed him. While he has bound him, he is not 
paralyzed. While he has circumvented what he's allowing him to do, there are things that he is allowed to do. And one of the things that he's allowed to do under the sovereign hand of God is to rage against Christ's church. Now, where do we find that in Scripture? Well, I would direct you to the 12th and 13th chapters of the book of Revelation, which gives a vivid picture of how Satan and his demons are actively warring against the church of Christ during this time between the first and second comings of Jesus Christ. Here's Christ. He, he rises from the grave. Here is the disciples turning into 120, then to 3,000, and then another 5,000. They're all getting added in every day. What does, the, what does Satan do? The evil empire strikes back. How? Persecution. Persecution against leaders. There's the death of Stephen. There's the death of James. Persecution against the church. It says they were all scattered from Jerusalem. So there is that constant... We're now actually... What that only did when he scattered the church was send the gospel to Judea, Samaria, and the other most part of the world. But that's what he is doing, is attempting to intimidate the church. That is strategy number one, is intimidation. Strategy number two is infiltration. If he can just keep the church from the unity of the mission and the message, if he can just get them with personal differences and petty preferences, and those things in order to, to, to separate them. See, that's what Satan, right here today, my guess is, and I'm not a prophet, but my guess is God's brought some people here today who are, God's working in their heart. And they're looking, they're looking uh, and wanting to know, how can I be right with God? My life is empty and all that the world has promised me is nothing but emptiness. And so perhaps they've been drawn here today. Perhaps you invited them. Perhaps they're here. They're, they're seeking. Maybe they just found it on the website. But God in his providence brought them here. What Satan doesn't want is a church when they come that's on mission, on message, and in ministry. That's what he doesn't want. Today's church in today's world, who are the allies? Who are the allies who are doing Satan's strategy? Who are the adver adversaries of Christ and his church who are doing the work that, uh, of Satan in intimidation and infiltration? Well, let me give you the four allies in today's world facing today's, that today's church faces. Number one, the first ally who is working on intimidation is theocratic fascist Islam. Just go read this last week. 148 of your brothers and sisters were in a college, and they were told by the terrorist organization of this Islamic caliphate movement, if you come out, you'll be safe. And they came out there in Kenya. I just finished, I'm, I'm right now corresponding with a bishop in Kenya over various things that we can do to assist them. But um, 140 plus of your brothers and sisters walked out there. And they were killed for Christ. So there is a real... Now, for most of us here, we have a hard time identifying that because you and I have lived in cultural affirmation. We have lived in a culture that affirms Christianity historically. And therefore, we have a hard time identifying with that. But what I'm speaking of that is the persecution against the church throughout the world is the norm. We have been in an abnormal situation. We have been in a blink of peace here for a couple of hundred years. Now, why have we? I think for two reasons. Number one is because of the effective witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the church of Christ in the early formation of this country as salt and light in terms of what was introduced into this culture through an effective church. They were never the majority, but they were salty, and they shone a lot of light, and it greatly affected this country. Again, Harry is highlighting our inability as Americans to comprehend what is right now going on in this world. There is immense Christian persecution happening all over the world, and so many Christians here are oblivious to it focusing instead on trying to live their best life now. Harry now turns to the second major intimidation factor. The second intimidation enemy is secular fascist humanism. 
Now, you understand that secular humanism has, has no place for religion. Religion in general is to be eradicated, and it particularly desires to eradicate Christianity. But where you are right now is they cannot eradicate religion in general or Christianity in particular. So what they're doing now, the secular humanist is doing what? The secular humanist is attempting to quarantine Christianity. So you can have your Bible study in your church. You can have your Bible study. You can have your worship service there, but you can't take what you believe into the the public square. We will reinterpret the First Amendment from the freedom of religion to the freedom to worship, and therefore put the church in a box and quarantine it so they keep it out of the public square, whether it's uh, whatever uh, matters of issue of public theology or the well-being of humanity, Christianity, what you believe is opinion, and therefore you keep your opinion. You're free to hold those superstitions in that building at that hour on that day, but it can't come out here. Well, but the intimidation allies are coupled with the infiltration allies. Let me give you the two of them, and then I'll give you the takeaway. Here are the two infiltration allies, theological liberalism and number four, church growth pragmatism. Those are the allies of Satan that, are being, that he uses in order to get the church off mission, off message, and out of its ministry. Theological liberalism. Now, I want to be as clear as I can with everyone here. I know there are Christians found in theologically liberal churches that have denied the inerrancy of God's Word, that have denied the exclusivity of the gospel and that you're only saved by Jesus, that you need a Savior. Ritual can't save you, and you can't save yourself, and you only need Christ. Liberalism denies the exclusivity of Christ as Savior, denies the necessity of grace for salvation, denies the inerrancy of God's Word, denies the supernatural presence of God in this world. They're called signs, wonders, and miracles. Denies all of those things. I believe that theological liberalism is the most virulent religious movement against Christianity, much worse than any other cult, much worse. Number four, church growth pragmatism. The desire is for 3,000 to come for Christ, 5,000 to come to Christ, more and more coming to Christ every single day. That's the, uh, that's the consequence, but the objective is to be faithful to Christ. But once church growth becomes the objective, then, and you're in a culture that determines what you believe is superstitious and ridiculous, then it's a matter of time that pragmatism, the end justifies the mean. What's the end? We've got to get people. Well, the culture doesn't like what we believe. The culture doesn't like what we believe about marriage. The culture doesn't like what we believe about ordination. The culture doesn't like what we believe about the family, about a man's responsibility. The culture doesn't like what we believe about gender distinctive. So what does the church do? Well, we got to keep the numbers so it begins to modify the message. The practice of pragmatism, which means just doing whatever works to get people in the door, is now the norm in the majority, well, almost the majority of, of all evangelical Christian churches today. It is a slippery slope that will only lead churches that were perhaps once faithful to the gospel towards Christian liberalism. Or it begins to modify the methods. So no longer is the preaching of the word important. No longer is discipleship important. Entertainment, that's the deal. That's what'll get the group in. And hey, by the way, pastor, could you give kind of a coach em up talk of about five points and then we can go back out to the game? I believe these two factors are the most dangerous influences in the Christian church today. You see, Christian persecution tends to strengthen the church and weed out those who were not really Christians to begin with. But these twin engines of liberalism and pragmatism so weaken and corrupt the gospel of Jesus Christ as to make it another gospel altogether. And it's a gospel that cannot save anyone. No church will ever die from state or culture-sponsored homicide. The church will not be murdered. But local churches, colleges, seminaries, and denominations do die. And they die not from homicide, from intimidation. They die from theological suicide as they drink the cup 
of a modified message of theological liberalism thinking it's the remedy for the survival of the church. So now that Harry has identified the problems, what is the remedy for the church of Jesus Christ? Well, I think Harry here is spot on. We need to stay on mission, on message, and in ministry. It's that simple. We need to stay on message, on mission, in ministry. And how do you do that? Stay fixed on Jesus. Stay fixed on Jesus. My brothers and sisters, let me just give you three little walkaways with this. Here's the first one. The best defense is a great offense. So let's leave here with personal evangelism. And then finally, prayer and the Word. Prayer and the Word. In fact, I'll close with this. In Ephesians 6 that I just read, would you have this picture? Put on the whole armor of God. And we've got six pieces to the armor of God. Do you know where that armor comes from? Do you know who it is that arms you? Who is the armorer? You're the armor bearer. Who is the armorer? It's hard to say. Armorer. You know, you're sitting there that's strapping it on. Now, you're putting it on, but who is it that's helping you pick up these pieces and putting on the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of self? Who is it that's helping you? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's giving you the strength to do that. But where do the arms come from? Where is the armory? It's the Word of God. Look at it. Ephesians 6. I'm, I'll just do this. He says, uh, put on the, put on, fasten the belt of truth. What's truth? The Word of God. Then put on the breastplate of righteousness. Where do you find out where right living is? The Word of God. Put your shoe, wear the gospel of peace as shoes. Where do you find out the gospel? The Word of God. Take up the shield of faith. Where does faith come from? Hearing the Word of God. That you uh, put on the helmet of salvation. Where do, you find the, where do you find the message of salvation to put on your head? It's, the, it's from the Word of God. And then, um, and then take up the sword of the Spirit. What's the sword of the Spirit? It's the Word of God. The Word of God is the armory from which the Holy Spirit arms you. Then you go out with the armor of God. And then six times, you not only have six instruments for the armor, six times it says, pray, 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 pray. So we got small groups of prayer all over here. Get in one and pray with persistent intercessory prayer. God, bring an awakening. Not simply let us hold the line on marriage. Bring an awakening for men and women to come to Jesus Christ. God, allow us. We're not going to pick a fight. We're not going to run from a fight. But when we fight the fight, our adversaries, we want to win them. That's what we want to do. We want to win them. And help us to win them by staying on message, on mission, in ministry. Your adversaries, we will meet the adversaries. We will resist him and he will flee from us.